Revelation chapter 16, 12 through 21. The world is prepared for Armageddon. This is talking about the world at that time, at the end of these bold judgments. But we are being prepared for the Antichrist coming as our world is changing. I realize that, don't you? Say, yes, I do. Okay, good. So in Revelation 16, 12 through 21, if you would, please stand for the reading of God's word. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out from the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth, and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. 
Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague. And the hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. This is the word of God. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you that you have shown us through these teaching and revelation that you are coming back. Indeed, this is the very end, these bold judgments, and you are demonstrating that there is a time when your patience ends in dealing with people or dealing with nations, and you are going to be taking back planet Earth. We will see the prelude to the Battle of Armageddon, the campaign of Armageddon today. Open our spiritual eyes, soften our hearts, help us to be attentive, and I pray that each person here will hear something specific from the Holy Spirit to them today that will affect their lives. Thank you that we're in the midst of our God right now. You are here with us. Speak to us, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. The world is being prepared for Armageddon. As you know, we've gone through the first five bold judgments. And these judgments are the wrath of God, the very end of the wrath of God on earth. And I don't know if you remember this, but Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, lest these days be cut short, no flesh would be saved, for, saved alive, but for the elect's sake, he will cut those days short. Look at this. Remember, the wrath of Antichrist is being poured out from the middle of the tribulation to the end of the tribulation. And I have to suspect there has to be nuclear weapons or something that is used in this, this, that conflict. But that's not the worst. The worst is the wrath of God being poured out. In these bold judgments, this is horrific what is happening to planet Earth. Planet Earth will be decimated, and unless Jesus intervenes, this whole planet and everybody on it would, would, have been, would be just eliminated. Eliminated. So these bold judgments, there's no more mercy that God is extending to rebellious humanity. Remember the first bowl, boils. Can you imagine that? Pustules. I'm getting a little graphic. Just <laughs> weeping. Just, just pain. It's the pain of the whole thing. Head to toe. And it doesn't go away. This isn't one of these staph infections. You take an antibiotic and it gets better. Oh, no. This is through the whole bold judgments. These folks are suffering from these boils. And then the second bowl was the sea turns turns to blood. And remember, 71% of the earth is, is, is salt water, is water. That all turns to blood, and everything within that, in that sea dies. Every fish, every octopus, every animal in the sea is dead, washing up on shore, and we talked about the stench that that would make, the incredible misery that planet earth is going to be going through. Then we, the third bowl was all fresh water, the rivers and the springs. The fourth bowl was a scorching sun. And we made the emphasis that global warming will finally come to planet Earth. And by the way, it hasn't come to Michigan yet, as you know. <laughs> hey, you want to escape global warming, America, come to Michigan. Yes, come to Michigan. But there will be global warming when God warms the world and he forms a new heaven and a new earth. That'll be global warming. Then the fifth bowl was darkness and death. And the amazing thing through all of this, they blaspheme the name of God. They blaspheme the name of God. What hubris, what arrogance. And then we had to ask this question. What is wrong with us as humans? What is wrong with humanity? And the thing that we came up with, and that I think is so germane to this, is that humans do not want God to reign over them. Humans want to run their own lives. Luke 19, 14, Jesus gave a parable of the ten minas. And he said this, and he's actually pointing towards himself, but his citizens hated him and sent a delegation to him telling him, you shall not rule over us. And that is what Jesus is saying, that you guys don't want me to rule over you. Isolated from God, rebelling against God, spending an eternity in what we traditionally call hell, but it is really the lake of fire. That's the end game for every human that rebels against the living God. Put into outer darkness. This week, we see the world is prepared for Armageddon in our text today. It is prepared. It is ripe. It is ready. And I want you to remember this. This is Satan's last stand. Armageddon, we usually say, oh, it's the end of the world. 
It is the end of the world to an extent, but it's really Satan's last stand. He gathers the armies. His spirits go out and gather the armies to fight against the living God and his plan. Remember the midpoint of the tribulation. Many things have happened. We talked that the Antichrist was killed, and we saw that in Revelation 13.3. Then they remembered Satan was booted out of heaven. He has the hubris, the arrogance to think he can take over heaven. And there's war in heaven. So he's booted out. And then the Antichrist is resurrected. Probably the miracle of Satan doing this once he's booted out out of heaven. And then what does Satan want to do? He inhabits the Antichrist. He possesses the Antichrist. And we see strong word usage to that in 13.4 and 17.8. And then the the Antichrist will break his peace covenant with Israel, Daniel 9.27. The false prophet comes up. And what does he do? He establishes the abomination of desolation in the temple and demands that the world worship the Antichrist. And if you don't worship the Antichrist, what happens to you? You're killed and you can't buy or sell. You must do this. Now, the Jews in Jerusalem at that time see that happening. And what do they do? Giddy up, giddy up, giddy up, giddy up. They flee, don't they? They flee to Basra. That's their, or Petra. Their, that's their place where God will protect them. And then Satan chases them. And what does God do? He's always a step ahead of Satan. I mean, Satan has to be the most frustrated dude in the universe. Every time he tries to do something, God goes, oh, oh, I just moved my piece over here, over here. The earth swells up, uh, swallows up his army. And what does Satan do? In a rage, he turns against the offspring, and he turns against those who keep the commands of God. Those Jews that are loyal to Yahweh, and every believer in, in the Lord Jesus Christ, he's turning on them to try to kill them. The earth dwellers, folks, are confirmed in their hatred of the true God. And we have seen that in these bold judgments where they continue to blaspheme God through all of the warnings, through all of the warnings. We've covered five bowls. We have bowl six and seven, and bowl six is going to be, we see the Euphrates River, this giant river is going to be dried up. Verse 12, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now, as, you, as I just said, the water from the Euphrates is dried up. Now, why would he mention this? Well, it's for the kings of the east to provide them a way to get into the Armageddon, get into this area. Now, I want you to think about something. I want you to think about the Euphrates River. This is a huge river. It's the biggest one in Western Asia. It's 1,780 miles long, 300 to 1,200 yards wide, 10 to 30 feet deep. It's an enormous size, and it's going to be dried up. And now some people postulate that it's dried up by the scorching heat, okay, the fourth bowl. But I would, I would submit to you that I believe that these bold judgments are the very end. I would say weeks, maybe a month, but it's a very short time to the end. Earth cannot sus- be sustained after these bold judgments. It has to be close to the end where Jesus is coming back. And I think that this is a miracle of God. Now, thinking about the Euphrates, I would like to put a picture up here. And the reason I'm doing this, you probably can't see this. This is the Tigris. This is the Euphrates. And this is Babylon. Babylon is located between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Babylon is the capital of Antichrist's kingdom. And Babylon actually means between the rivers. This is a giant river, and it will be dried up to allow the kings of the east to come over and to gather in Megiddo, which would be over in this place. I'll have some pictures of that more in just a second. So with that stated, thinking about Babylon, in verse 19, we read this. Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Why is that? Because Babylon has been the seat through history of all false religions. All false religions. And it's Antichrist's seat of power. In Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, in the New Living Translation, this is the first time you're ever going to hear me say this, but it was the easiest one to read. So watch this. It says, Cush was also the the ancestor of Nimrod. Nimrod is the big deal in Babylon. Nimrod is the one that many people feel instigated the Tower of Babel 
where there was rebellion against God, worshiping the false gods, and then they, God came down and, and confused the language and made them spread out because they wanted to stay there. Humanism wanted to have his way, their way, and God says, no, you will spread out, and he confused the languages. Nimrod was, was a heroic warrior in that time, and he was probably the one instrumental in this. Since he was the greatest hunter in the world, that's what the scripture says, his name became proverbial. People would say, this man is like Nimrod, pointing to somebody that was great in their community. The greatest hunter in the world. Then it says in verse 10, he built his kingdom in the land of Babylonia, where he would instigate a rebellion against God. Now, in, in, now remember, all world religions, oh, I forgot where I put it. All world religions have their root in Babylon. In verse-by-verse verse ministry, he made, this guy made a pie chart. And in this pie chart, and by the way, this has got line-upon-line line teaching. And this guy does a really good job, if you ever are interested in it. Verse-by-verse verse ministry out of San Antonio, Texas. But anyway, this is a pie chart. All world religions emanate from Babylon. And notice that it has Christianity as the only one true religion. Now, there's 8 billion or so people on earth. This should be a chart that gets, that's, that's one-fourth. This guy is actually telling the truth. There are not 2 billion Christians on earth. There are 2 billion people that might claim the name of Christianity or use the tag of Christianity, but there are not 2 billion. Some people might think that there's, a, there's, a, there's 500 million or something. Nobody really knows, but it is not the number that people claim that it is. But all false religions come from Babylon. On the next slide... You're going to see verse by verse ministry. We want to give this guy credit. The Tower of Babel, that would be this picture. It's the home of all sin. Babylon is the home of all sin. It's the origin of idolatry. It was the first nation to conquer Israel. And the biggest thing that we want to see is it was Antichrist headquarters and it will be destroyed. Destroyed. We'll see that coming in the future. So, think about rivers being dried up. Think about rivers being dried up. Again, I believe that this is a supernatural event by God. I think he dries the river up, much like he did the Red Sea to allow the Jews to cross on dry land, much as he did with the Jordan River when it was dried up to allow Joshua to cross, much like when he used Elijah to part the waters of the Jordan in 2 Kings 2.8. I think this is an act of God. Any way you look at it, the Euphrates River in its vastness and mass volumes of water will be dried up. So the kings of the east can join in this fight at Megiddo. They want to participate in the campaign of Armageddon. Now, how are we going to get all of these nations from around the world to Megiddo? Well, we see that in verse 13, 14, and 16 they're going to be demonic spirits that are used in this process. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. Now look, when you're a little kid and you're playing in the, in, in the water and it's spring and you got all these little frogs jumping around, frogs are cool to you. But I'm going to show you in just a second, frogs aren't so cool. Coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, the unholy trinity, for they are spirits of demons performing signs, miracles throughout the world, which go out to the kings of the earth, mesmerize them, and of the whole world, and gather them together to the battle of the great day of God Almighty, verse 16. And they gather them together to a place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon. Now, I want you to think about something. Why would Armageddon happen now? Why didn't it happen in the, in, in the trumpet judgments? Why does it happen at this point? And I think it is this. The bold judgments in their horror and their finality have moved the satanic trinity to desperate measures. Look at the whole kingdoms of this world have been attacked by God through these judgments. And they know that their demise is imminent. Life on earth has become unbearable. I think this is a desperation effort, a desperation effort by Satan. Now, the first thing that we see is, are these three unclean spirits, are these frogs, spirits like frogs, 
unclean and loathsome. And I want you to remember Egypt with the plague, plague of frogs. And again, these aren't little frogs. Chirpy, 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 looking like the little thing you played with. This is what I think they look like. I mean, can you imagine this? These big, giant frogs. Every place you go, squish. Every, squish. You lay down on your bed, squish. Isn't that nasty? That's some nasty stuff right there. Spirits like frogs. This guy named Sice in his, in his commentary on Revelation talks about frog spirits. Now watch what he says. Quote, they are elect agents to awaken the world to attempt to abolish God from the earth. And they are frog-like and they come forth out of the quagmires of the universe. Isn't this nasty? Ooh. To do their work amid the world, evening shadows creep and croak and defile and fill the ears of the nations with their noisy demonstrations till they set all the kings and armies of the whole world in enthusiastic commotion for the final, this is what they think, the crushing of the lamb in all of his powers. It's so diabolical. It is so nefarious, wicked. That's what that word, wicked. That's what it is. It's just so wicked. And they are coming out of the unholy trinity. Remember Satan, the counterfeit father, the antichrist, the counterfeit son, the false prophet, the counterfeit Holy Spirit, the satanic trinity, and they, their demise is imminent, and this is their last-ditch effort to thwart Messiah's return. Their goal, gather all the armies of the world at Megiddo for this final confrontation with God. That word battle, that final battle, is polemos. And it actually means war, more than one battle. And you'll see the campaign of Armageddon as we get into it next week are several stages. There's actually eight stages in this battle. In verse 16, they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon, which is Har Megiddo, or the hill of Megiddo. The world armies are gathered at Megiddo, and some people call it the place of troops. The place of troops. Now remember the picture that we had. We've had this several times. It's just so impressive because it's a vast area. Now one thing I didn't mention is, is that this is in the Jezreel Valley. This is 145 square miles. You're not seeing the whole thing here. You're just seeing a little part of it. And it connects Asia, Europe, and Africa. And through history, caravans would go into Israel and disperse through these other places in, in the world with their goods. Armies came through the same way. In the next p picture, we're going to have the Jezreel Valley, and I just wanted to point this out. It's, it's a huge area. Again, 145 square miles. It was, it was a, a trade route, uh, route again. And the next slide. And I, the reason I put this in here, it demonstrates basically the same thing. But Megiddo is right on the edge of the Jezreel Valley. And this is where this campaign will take place. There are mountains on the north, south, east, and west of this valley. This is where all the armies of the world will gather under Antichrist charge and have the hubris and arrogance to think that they're going to defeat Jesus and his plan. That's an amazing thing to me. Amazing. The goal of the satanic trinity, and again, they're desperate. Okay, they're desperate. To kill every remaining Jew loyal to Yahweh. That's number one. And why are they doing that? To thwart the return of Messiah. To stop the Jews. You know the two things that they have to do. If you've been here, you know what this is. To stop the Jews from pleading for Messiah to return. And to stop the Jews or prevent them from admitting their national sin of rejecting Messiah. If we can kill every Jew, then, then, then they can't plead for Jesus to come back. And that has been happening throughout history. Satan has known this for a long time. And that is why the anti-Semitism that you've seen through the history of the world, and by the way, anti-Semitism is starting to crescendo again in our world. And you watch what, well, I'll skip that, but uh, I think with this administration change, you're going to see a different attitude with the nation of Israel. And remember the promise that God has given, 
in, in Genesis chapter, chapter 12, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And most of the world doesn't believe it. But look at the nations that have done that to Israel and where they are today. If all the Jews are dead, Satan wins. But you know what? Satan has a huge problem. You know what that problem is? God. <laughs> God. God will preserve his people. The nation of Israel, his church, he will preserve his people. God will rescue his people. And again, many attempts have been, been taken throughout history to exterminate the Jews. And God will establish his new covenant with his people. The new covenant is a fact, folks. It is not a fantasy. The new covenant is where God will save the Jewish people, the remnant. It is recorded in Jeremiah in several places, but the easiest one to read and the most succinct, I think, is Jeremiah 31, 31. He says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Now remember, all the covenants that we are given in Scripture are given to Israel, not the church. The church benefits because it's grafted into Israel, but Israel is the focus of that. We are again, our beneficiaries because we're grafted in. So not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them out of, by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Not the Mosaic covenant, not the law covenant, which, which they broke. Though I was a husband to them. Remember, Israel is called the wife of Jehovah. The church is called the bride of Christ. There's a relationship there, an intimate relationship says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I'll make with, make with the house of Israel. After those days, after what days? The tribulation, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Notice this intimacy. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. God will take their stone hearts, make them into soft, pliable hearts. It's the same thing he does when he brings us into the family of God. He's doing with the nation of Israel. All of them will be saved. They will believe in Messiah in mass at the very end of the tribulation period. That's a praise God. Now again, the new covenant, remember Jesus initiated the new covenant in his blood. And we remember that at the, at, 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 at the Lord's table. At the Lord's table. This cup is the new covenant in my blood that this do in remembrance of me. Think about this. The bold judgments. Jesus is coming. The wrath of God is being poured out on earth. And Jesus is coming as a thief. Watch this. Verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Verse 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. A fact, a fact, a fact, a fact, that, the, that the, most of the world denies. Jesus said this, you can count on it, I am coming. I am coming. And I want to tell you this, this is written in the present tense. Might not mean anything to you, but the present tense means it's happening now, this is so sure in the mind of God that it's a fait complete. It's happening now. It's, he's on his way. This is a great thought for us. Okay? This is a great thought for us. For the rest of the world, it's, ah! But for us, it's, yes! Come, Lord Jesus. He's coming as a thief, meaning this. No one knows the day or the hour of his return. Now, when someone starts saying, that in 1988, there's eight reasons. Just immediately say, he's not coming in. No one knows the day or the hour. Matthew 24, 36, Jesus speaks of his second coming. He's coming in judgment. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What is Jesus doing? He's coming to take back the kingdoms of this world. Remember in Revelation 11:15. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. And what does it say? He shall reign forever. And you can just scream that. The imagery is clear for us, folks. Be ready. Be ready for Jesus' return. Be ready. 
Jesus told the the church at Sardis to be watchful. He will come as a thief. Be ready is a theme of Scripture. You know what that tells me? That tells me I can't be lazy. I can't be indolent. I can't be disengaged, off doing my own thing. Be ready. He also says this in the same verse. He who watches. That is written also in the present tense. You know what that means? We keep watching. Keep watching. We don't watch for a day. Oh, I'm watching for Jesus for a day. I did my duty. Or a month. Or a year. How long do you keep watching? For, for your whole life. Your whole life. From your entrance date, born, to your exit date. Your dash in between is your life. You're watching for your whole life. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Watchfulness, let me suggest this to you. I believe is an evidence of true faith. If I'm watching for Jesus, I can't wait for him to come back. Folks, that's true faith. That's true faith. True faith will keep their salvation garments. True faith will keep watching and be ready. Jesus to the church of Sardis, again, was a dead church in Revelation 3, 4. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. True believers, that is you. You are clothed in the righteousness of Christ as a picture of purity, righteousness before our holy God, all because of what Jesus did. Those who failed to watch were never true believers, never overcomers, never nikeos, victors. Remember this? There's there's people that can look good, sound good, smell good, have the Christianese, do their religious stuff, but be tares among the wheat. Remember the wheat and the tares? They look the same, don't they? You can't tell the difference until the harvest. By the way, this is the wheat, this is the tare. And we went through that whole imagery where you can't tell until the harvest. Jesus knows. You can fool your brother. You can fool your sister. You can fool your mom and your dad, but you cannot fool Jesus. It's just that simple. A tear is, is not legitimate. Luke 21, 36 says this, they are the ones who will not be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. They will be found naked and ashamed. Jesus' warning is clear. Watch and be ready. Jesus will come for you. Let me pause right there. That's going to come up on the screen. Jesus will come for you. This is a fact. And for us, that's oh, happy day. Now, he might come, and we're hoping, everybody in this room is hoping for the rapture of the church. Come and take me, Lord. I don't want to go through that process, that nasty process of dying. Okay? But this also speaks, he's going to come for you one way or the other. We have to remember that. So we are all to be called to be ready, to be ready, to be ready. Do you know this in Psalm 139, 16, that all the days ordained for you were given before one of them came to be? You had an entrance, you had an exit date, you have a line, all of them were given to you. Some will go sooner, some will go later, but all of them go. How long did Methuselah live? The book of God's going to be enough. <laughs> That's the closest we ever got the tongues in here, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 969 years. 969 years. And you know what? He died. Noah lived 950 years. How long did he? What does it say after that? And he died. He died. After everyone's entrance, there's an exit, and they died. We have to deal with that. There's a reality there. There's a reality there. We're to watch and be ready. In, in verse 17, the, the seventh bowl is poured out. And the, and the words here that you really want to focus on is this. It is done. It is done. Now watch this. Verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air in a loud voice. And I think this is God's voice. It's coming out of the temple. Remember, God is in the temple. Everyone else is out of the temple. This is the naos. This is the holy of holies. This is God speaking from the throne saying, It is done. It is done. It is finished. What is finished? Antichrist kingdoms are finished. 
Let me ask you a question. And I bet you know where I'm going with this. When did Jesus say, when he walked this earth, it is finished? It was on the cross. It was on the cross. The sixth cry from the cross in John 19.30. It is finished. you know what that cry was? It's a cry of victory. It's a victory chant. It's a, vict- it's, a, it's a cry of finality. The redemption price has been paid for you. Put your name there. Put your name there. It is finished. Jesus died for you and he died for me. And, I, and that word should be music to the believer's ears. Music to our ears. What is finished? Well, Jesus' suffering was finished. You know, Jesus came to do the Father's will. What was the Father's will for Jesus? To die on the cross for the sins of the world. To take all of the wrath of God on himself. That whoever believes this can be saved from the wrath of God, saved to heaven, and live with God in the family of God forever. All of his suffering was finished. His sacrifice was was finished. The defeat of Satan was finished, who had, by the way, the power of death, through sin. Remember, sin causes death. Jesus dealt with sin, therefore he's dealt with death. Jesus assures every believer of heaven, what's he assuring us? You will get there safely. You can, you're guaranteed of that. Jesus guarantees it. All of my sins. Now place your name there. All of Rick's sins. All of Jimmy's sins or Sammy's sins or Sally's sins. I don't know if there's any people in here that name that, but anyway are paid in full. It is finished. Past, present, and future. Every single sin in the history of the world was placed upon Jesus Christ on the cross. Now think about that statement, paid in full. Think about this. It's applied to believers only. Okay, you have to believe and receive the gift of salvation for this to be efficacious or effective for you. But think about what was paid in full. Listen to this list. Abortion paid in full. Adultery, paid in full. Cheating, lying, greed, selfishness, paid in full. Gluttony, drunkenness, gossip, and you can continue your list. Paid in full. All the sins of humanity, paid in full. This is important. Again, you and I were born with an expiration date. You see that on your milk bottle, don't you? When you go to Sam's Club, what are you digging through the back stuff trying to get the the latest expiration date possible? Hey, you have an expiration date, and you're not changing that date. All the days ordained for you were given before one of them came to be. One of them came to be. Only Jesus can pay the full price for you. And again, it's effective only for those who believe. The seventh angel with the seventh bowl, cries out loud and clear. Make no mistake about this. What he is saying, Jesus Christ, the one who paid the price to redeem us, to free us from Satan's clutches, is taking back the kingdoms of this world. Finally, we'll have a righteous king that will live forever and ever and ever. No more phony baloney governments. No more criminal governments. He's taking back the kingdoms of this world. And Satan, by the way, is indeed finished. His goose is cooked. And it's already cooked. He just doesn't know it yet. And Christ is this. Christus victor. The victor over Satan. The victor over sin and death. Do you know what death is? Death isn't no longer existing. Death is separation from God. That's what death is. Jesus told Mary and Martha, the house of Mary and Martha when when their brother Lazarus died. And they were kind of wondering, why aren't you coming, Jesus? We sent word for you, Jesus. Why aren't you coming to save our brother Lazarus? You love him. He's He's your cousin. I mean, for crying out loud, Jesus, come and save him. And he didn't. He delayed. And Lazarus was in the grave for four days. And then Jesus shows up. And he says to Martha, who's a little disturbed with Mary because she's tending to Jesus, She's doing her Martha stuff. And they're talking about that. Why? What happened, Jesus? And Jesus says one of the I am statements. Remember, the I am statements, there's seven in the book of John. The I am is the ego am I. 
He is saying to seven times in the book of John, I am the I am of Je Exodus chapter 3. I am the living God. I am the creator of the world. Remember, everything was made by God, and through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. When we see Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that was Jesus doing the creation. You have to remember that. Notice what he says in this, in John 11:25. 25. And this is something that, that I like to say at every believer's funeral. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never, ever, I, I, I'm exaggerating here, ever, ever, ever die. That is a promise to you. Never will you be separated from God. You know that Paul knew this in 2 Corinthians 5.8. Absent from the body is what? Present with the Lord. That's why we can say as believers, when we're going through the pain of the separation of someone dying that is a believer, we're going through, there's still pain with that. Okay, death always brings pain, but it's momentary. It's momentary. God has given us a wonderful promise that one day we'll all be together in Father's house. Death has been, been, been dealt with. And we can say in our heart of hearts, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Jesus has made this thing as awful as it is tolerable because we know they're in a better place and would never, never elect to come back here. I've often told people, if I'm dying and you try to resuscitate me and I'm already halfway there, I'm going to be really ticked off at you coming back here. I mean, half my ribs are broken for the... yeah. It's so sad, folks, that people today, or the earth dwellers then, put their trust in satanic delusions, buy into the strong delusions, and they don't experience what Jesus has paid it all for. And they, what they face next in our text is terrifying. They will face a giant earthquake and hail that is 75 pounds apiece. Boom, 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 boom. Carpet bombing earth. Boom, 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 boom with this hail. Think about it. Verse 18 through 20. And there were noises and thunderings and lightning. Now remember in Exodus chapter 19 on Mount Sinai when God is addressing the nation of Israel in preparation for the law. There were noises and there were thunderings and there were light and the people were scared to death. This is the power of God being exhibited here. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. And watch this. Such a mighty and great earthquake as not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. That's Jerusalem. And the cities of the nations fell all over the world. And great Babylon was remembered before God. They're going to get a special spanking. To give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's Antichrist headquarters. And every island fled away. The whole topography of earth is changing. And the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. And each hailstone about the weight of a talent, 75 pounds. Men blaspheme. This is astounding to me. Men blaspheme God because of the plague of hail, since the plague was exceedingly great. That, folks, is mind-blowing. All of nature will bust loose. In terrifying devastation, the horror will be unimaginable. There are numerous earthquakes that we see in Scripture. Just in the book of Revelation, uh, we saw in Revelation 6 there was an earthquake. We saw the seventh seal, there was an earthquake. We saw Jesus warning as it gets closer to the end time that there will be signs that tell us of birth pangs. There will be famines and pestilence and, and earthquakes in diverse places, all over the place, increasing, increasing. At the ascension of the two witnesses, remember when Antichrist kills them and they lie in the streets and the, and the world is jumping hip, hip, hooray, and in three and a half days, what happens? They rise up, they elevate, they are resurrected. There was a great earthquake then. 
This earthquake surpasses all of them. Haggai in Haggai 2.6 said, said this. He prophesied a great, about a great shaking which would involve all the nations prior to the recognition of Christ and the return of the Shekinah. The Shekinah glory of God to the millennial temple. Remember the Shekinah is a pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, pillar of light. How did Jesus go up in Acts chapter 1 verse 9? He went up in the clouds. How does it say in Revelation 1 7 when he returns? He comes back in the clouds. That's the Shekinah glory of God. The Shekinah glory of God. The effects of this massive quake are global and hail are global. Jerusalem is divided into three parts and you wonder what's the big deal there? Well, it's in preparation for the millennial kingdom. The cities throughout the world will collapse in utter ruin. Babylon will experience the fierceness of his wrath. And in chapter 17 and 18, after we get through with the campaign of Armageddon, we'll have more teaching on Babylon and how horrific it really is. To top it all off, hailstones, 75 pounders will be carpet bombing the earth. You ever see a B-52 when it goes over? Big giant thing. And they release their bombs all over the place. I mean, the devastation is amazing. Think of the hail balls, 75 pounds, all over earth, all over planet earth. And what do the earth dwellers do? Blaspheme God. They know who is bringing the destruction, yet they continue in their unbelief. It is an astounding thing to me. Now, let's, in closing, the world is prepared for Armageddon. That is our talk. God has given us a clear picture. He's given us a clear, clear picture of what's going to happen. But remember this, and never, ever, ever forget this. God always warns before he judges. He always warns before he judges. Whether it's a person, whether it's a nation, you will receive some sort of warning. In your spirit, something will happen. You will know. The entire book of Revelation is a warning that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming in judgment, and Jesus is coming to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember, he warns so that people turn and live. And he does this over and over. Now we know, and we're living in a time where we believe that the world is being prepped for the Antichrist. This globalism is on full speed ahead. Nations are rebelling against the true God, I think, in record numbers. When you look at Europe, where it was and where it is today, where 2 or 3% of Europe is now Christian, real Christian. Where in America today, in the younger population, is about 5%. Now, its numbers are higher because you've got a bunch of old people that are still believing the truth. So let's say 30% of America would still be counted as Christian. Marxism is rising, folks. It's raising its ugly head. Marxism is humanism. Marxism is, the, is, is you worship the government God, and the human is at the top of the food chain. Not God. God is cast out. God is cast out. Make no mistake, globalism is man, it, it, it's, it's humanism. It's men, women running the world devoid of any influence of the true God. And you can see what's happening today. The writing is on the wall in this country and throughout the rest of the world. If you worship the true God, you're going to be ostracized. You're going to, be, you're going to go through suffering. Hey, we're pre-trib rapture. But that does not mean that we're not going to suffer for our faith. We know that people throughout the world today are suffering in record numbers. You've heard this so many times, I don't want to really repeat it, but it is happening today. And we have been insulated from that. Insulated from that because we have worshipped the true God. We've enjoyed a standard of living that is unprecedented in the history of the world. America has. Why? Coincidence? Because we're lucky? We're just good workers. Oh, we're just so good. We're, so, we're good. No! America was founded on godly principles. And remember this, obedience precedes blessings. That is a principle of life. Obedience to God precedes blessings. Our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our republic form of government reflects this. The worship of the true God was the primary reason for people coming to America. To worship free of governmental interference. 
That is threatened today like none other time in the history of our nation. Even in the Civil War, there was a faith on both sides. On both sides. Christian nations have prospered under Christian principles and have now abandoned the true God and are now experiencing a decline in their cultures. There's chaos in the streets. And by the way, when you see the home disintegrating, that is kind of the end of a culture. And that is what we are seeing today. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. These are glaring signs of a decline. And what do we do? We cover our eyes. We cover our ears. And we pretend it's not happening. And God is warning. And God is warning. And God is warning. That's how he does. He always warns before he judges. They turn from the true God. The Bible warned us about what happened to Israel when they abandoned God. And we should learn from history, not tear down history. Marxism always tears it down so that Marxism is the only thing that the people know. Never have a, have a view of something else. That's what happens. That's what you are seeing today with statues torn down. Make no mistake. That is what you are seeing today. We are to learn from history. We are to learn from our mistakes we are not to erase our mistakes. Micah chapter 3 tells us about the national corruption. Verses 8 through 12. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. That helps you, doesn't it? <laughs> Psalm, turn to the right. And just start thumbing through. And we know what happened to the nation of Israel. The three offices were corrupt. Prophet, priest, and king. And the summation is in verse 11. Her heads judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for pay. And her prophets divine for money. What was the bottom line of those three things? Money. Never forget this. People want money, power, which brings control. Money, power, control. Happened in the nation of Israel. Yet they lean on the Lord. They have this, this, this feigning that they're, that they're religious. And they say, is not the Lord among us? No. No harm can come to us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. That's Israel, Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins. And the mountain of the temple, like the bare hills of the forest, in 586 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came and he leveled it. There's three sieges. The temple was leveled. In 70 AD, the same thing happened with Rome when, when the temple was rebuilt, Herod's temple. And it was leveled. Because they did not follow the true God. It always goes down. Her heads judge for a bribe. bribe. The priests teach for pay. Prophets divine for money. The nation was rife. Was full of corruption. All are in it for the money, the power, and the fleeting fame. And all were in it for themselves. Look what's happening today. You look at politicians today, and they are in it for themselves. In it for themselves. The power and the money. How can a person go to Congress, make 120000 or whatever it is a year, and in 30 years... Multi, 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 multi millionaires. How does, how does that happen? They're just really smart, good investors. What's going on? Money. Does this sound familiar? Remember, exit God, enter self, enter chaos. Micah was a prophet that was warning. And again, God always warns before he judges. God will eventually, now hear this, please. He will either give a nation or a person over to the desires of their heart. The problem is, is what is your heart? Jeremiah 17 tells us it's desperately wicked. The heart is, des is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? The last thing that a person wants to do is to be true to their heart. You hear that all the time when people are manipulating what they want to do with some, sin, with some sin. Folks, we need a heart transplant. And God gives us that transplant when we believe. He gives us a new heart, 
I'll give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you when you, when you believe. In Ezekiel 36. That was extemporaneous. That might not be right. Only Jesus, I can say this is right, only Jesus can give you a new heart. Now, thinking about cold hearts, thinking about deceitful hearts, we've been to this verse, these verses many times. Romans 1, 24 through 28. Every Christian's familiar with this. Every, most people are. There's three phases to the moral decline of a person or a nation. Phase one is they've given up to uncleanness. Sexual lust, that's verse 24, Romans 1, 24. That happened with my generation in the 60s. We just ushered it in. It wasn't just that. It was pot and drugs and everything else. What a pitiful generation. I don't know how we, got, how we did that, but we did. God gave, the second is God gave them up to vile passions. That was homosexual lust. That was the 80s and 90s. And then finally, phase three is God gave them over to a debased mind. Now, you know what that is. All unrighteousness becomes righteous. All evil is called good. Good is called evil. And it's just a free for all to believe whatever you want. And where do you think America is today? Phase three, given over totally. And I would suggest to you, we've heard a lot about America's best days are ahead unless America repents. Unless America turns back to the true living God, America will experience what the rest of the world experiences when they have turned away from the living God. We can join the ranks with the rest of the world. In our text today, the armies are massing in Megiddo. They are against the true God. They're being true to their hearts, their stone-cold hearts. They're fighting against God. And folks, they've been deceived by the master deceiver. This is true. And they think they can run the world their way. That's wrong. Nations will fight against God. How many people fight against God? Everyone that does not submit to him are actively engaged in a fight against God. I will not have you rule over me, Jesus. I will have my way. Or I will make Jesus up in my mind in such a way that I control him instead of he controlling me. So I can do whatever I want to do. The nations will fight against God, attempt to destroy the people of God. God has warned and God has warned and all that is left. When you get to the end of the road with a nation or a person, utter destruction of every and all that are aligned against the true God. The picture today that in our teaching is this. The armies are gathered. Their plan has been established. Antichrist will get news from that Babylon has fallen. We'll see that next week. His capital will have fallen. Why is that? Because some of the nations have rebelled against him, destroyed his capital. Instead of going back to defend his capital, you know what he does? He turns on Jerusalem. He will take all of his forces to march against Jerusalem. The campaign has begun. And why does he do that? His goal is kill every Jew possible. The eradication campaign will be in full swing. Next week, the campaign of Armageddon, culminating in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. He really is coming back. He really is. Take heart, folks. Jesus is coming. Jesus will come to judge, and Jesus will come to reign as King of kings and Lord of lords. And let me say this. Your rescue is on the way. The King is coming. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this time that you've given us again to study the infallible and errant Word of God. And Lord, I just pray that people will get a sense that you are in full control. This world looks out of control, but you are behind the scenes orchestrating what is happening. I mean, it might look awful, and it might look terrible, and you've given some latitude to Satan and the demonic realm, but they have a leash. They can only go so far, and then you will come and return to establish your kingdom where all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever. You are on a rescue mission, Lord. You're coming to rescue your people. And we thank you today for that. And we thank you for the day that you opened our spiritual eyes. 
You softened our hard stone hearts. And you gave us the ability to say yes to the Lord Jesus. Thank you for saving us. We'll say that for eternity. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.